All right, it is 10.06 on the Talk of Chicago, 1690 WBON. My name is Perry Small, and this is the Midday Show. Don't forget to go to WBON.com and participate in the daily listener poll. And the poll question is, since we haven't had a budget in the state of Illinois for nine months, um, is it time for the lawmakers not to get their salary? Since everybody else is feeling the burn and is going through all kind of uh, layoffs and cuts and uh, the elimination of institutions that have been around for more than 100 years. Is it time for something to happen? You're going to love this next story or our next guest. Um, and I, I'm going to get to your calls because it's all still kind, kind of, you know, intertwined. So last week, you know, they had the, they released the task force report on the Chicago Police Department. And um, people weren't surprised, as African Americans and other right-minded thinking people, um, this was no surprise. I think this is why a lot of us are having problems with the story that we just talked about. Joining us on the live line is Janai Nelson. She is the Associate Director Counsel for the Legal Defense and Educational uh, Fund. Janai, thank you so much for, uh, is it Janaya? It's Janae, actually. Uh, Janaya. Okay, thank you so much for joining us. Um, right before you came on, we were having the conversation. You might have seen it or you might have not. But in Benton Harbor in 2005, this cop wakes up and he says, I'm going to make a, a drug arrest today. He, um, you know, falsifies information, the report, uh, plants drugs on him. Guy gets um, a prison sentence. He spends four years in jail. They finally find out that he's a dirty cop, um, find out that he's a dirty cop. He spends a year and a half in jail, and now they're best buds. So they're best buds in Benton Harbor. So my point is, is that this is nothing new to those of us who live in African-American communities or how we're perceived wherever we go. There, there's, this is no surprise. So the majority of our callers, I'd say 98% of our callers, were so livid that this man could befriend the man who, um, who if he never would have been caught, he probably would have continued doing this. And they had to actually throw out a lot of different cases and get, you know, exonerate people from jail. And he becomes friends with them. He does it because of his heart. And he admits when he got when he was going to get out of prison, he said that he was going to, um, you know, find him and he wanted to hurt him. And so when you guys had a look at the report uh, by the Police Accountability Task Force in Chicago, um, was there anything that surprised you in the report, or were you expecting, and or, or were you surprised that that they were so forthcoming in the report? I'd like to hear what you think about it. Absolutely. So, um, sadly, and I feel that we say this all the time, there were no surprises. This is not data that is new to us as an African-American community. It's certainly not new to the NAACP Legal Defense Fund and the work that we've been doing on policing reform for decades. Our our founder, Thurgood Marshall, um, started his career defending against police brutality and police violence against young black men in the South. So this is not new to us at all. We see this as part of the long continuum of abuse by those in law enforcement. Um, but what was um, refreshing, I should say, is the candor with which the data was revealed, the mm-hmm. context that they took care to include in the very in-depth and thorough report of the reports that have come out about police departments around the country um, recently and, and over time, frankly, this report is certainly one of the best ones in terms of revealing the problem to those who were not aware of it, um, doing a very thorough job, and, and not shying away from the fact that uh, a significant part of this is deeply rooted in racism. Mm-hmm. Um, that is something that you know, we, we often confront people not wanting to acknowledge the impact and effect of blatant racism in the criminal justice system, in law enforcement, and, and I appreciate that this report did not shy away from that and was very um, demanding 
in what it believes should be the next step going forward, um, in what it believes, uh, what the task force believes should happen, um, who, whose charge it is. It's not only on the community, but it's on law enforcement to make that first step, uh, to take us in a new direction. And I think the accountability and the responsibility that it has laid at the feet of elected officials in Chicago and at law enforcement officials in Chicago is exactly in the right place, and I was pleased to see that. You know, the media across the, the nation, not necessarily here in Chicago, but they looked absolutely shocked that the word racism actually appeared in the report and, and acknowledged the racism within the department on so many levels. It took people aback. I mean, it was on the nightly news. Do you think that we're having a difficult time addressing uh, well, we are. We, you know, they always say that we're, tr- you know, you can't make everything about racism. But as with the Legal Defense Fund, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, and the reason why Thurgood Marshall um, started the, uh, the fund, when is that conversation going to happen? Do you think it's more difficult today to have that true conversation about racism Rather it be institutional, because Bernie Sanders and, 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 and Secretary Clinton, I mean, he actually made Hillary Clinton, you know, start addressing these, um, these types of issues and using the word racism. Uh, what, do, what do you think we're going to see um, come time for the general election? Are, are they still going to be having those conversations? You know, I, I hope so. Uh, the, the Legal Defense Fund is a nonpartisan organization, and so, you know, we don't endorse any particular candidate, right. and, and, and that, is, that is not the position we take. What we do uh, do, on the other hand, is we ensure that the issues that are of importance and significance to the African-American community and to uh, uh, folks who want to continue to advance our civil rights are brought to the attention of each presidential candidate um, and other elected officials. So we have met with um, some of the presidential candidates. We, uh, along with a coalition of other civil rights organizations, have extended invitations to every single presidential candidate mm-hmm. to sit down with them and brief them on the issues that we think are of most significance. And, and you raise an excellent point about the difficulty that we have faced uh, from time immemorial about having a, a true reckoning around the issue of race in this country. Mm-hmm. Um, and it ebbs and flows, right? There right. are times when we're, we're cognizant of it, we recognize it. Uh, that, that's what came out of the civil rights movement, a real recognition that race was holding us back as an entire country, mm-hmm. that it was a, a scourge on our democracy, and that it's something that we had to take very specific legal action to address. I think we are at one of those crisis moments in our country right now. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we aren't, as so many had hoped, you know, in an era of post-racialism that, that people thought you know, was ushered in by President Obama's election. We are still confronting race. We are still confronting racism. Mm-hmm. And unlike uh, you know, a lot of the discussions we have to begin with, you know, trying to describe to people what the problem is and that race still matters. I do think people are entering this discussion with a greater degree of understanding uh, about the role of race and with a greater acceptance that, that it still is, is an issue confronting our communities and that we all collectively need to do something about it. Obviously, not everyone feels that way, but I, but I can say that we have less explaining to do uh, when we enter these conversations, and we now have more uh, uh, responsibility to drive people towards solution. Yeah. We're talking to Janae Nelson, Associate Director, Counsel, Legal Defense Education of the Legal Defense um, and Educational Fund at the NAACP. Um, so let me ask you a little bit, um, Counselor, let me ask you a little bit about the Defense Fund right now. W- what would our listeners be surprised at what you guys have been doing, um, you know, or what, you're, what, what you guys are doing on a daily basis at the Le- NAACP Legal Defense Fund? What, what would be of note to our listeners? Uh, sure. Well, um, if you if you don't already know about the Legal Defense Fund, we have been in existence for over 75 years. We are the oldest 
civil rights legal organization in the nation. Uh, we are an organization of lawyers who have advocated uh, for the rights of African Americans and for civil rights more broadly, um, and, and and we've done that in every possible hall of power in this country. Um, the the case that we're most known for is Brown versus Board of Education, which ended segregation in the South. Um, but of course, as we know, that single case did not dismantle the system, and it has taken continued enforcement of those principles in every sphere of our society mm -hmm. to get us to the place where we are today, which is still not at the finish line. So we work in the areas of criminal justice. We work in the areas of voting and political participation, in economic justice, um, and, and, and education, of course, is, is at our core. And I would say, I mean, one of the things that, that we do, which is in some ways an unfortunate position to be in, is, is we step in when sometimes the government has not. Mm -hmm. uh, we oftentimes work with uh, the government, the Department of Justice, to advance policies and goals and, and pursue what we see as uh, constitutional rights. Uh, violations of constitutional rights, but we also step in when we see that there's a void in power, um, and we have done that. I would say what would probably be very of note to your listeners who are interested in this conversation is a hearing that we had just recently in North Charleston, South Carolina. If everyone remembers, um, you know, not long ago we saw a man brutally shot, Mr. Walter Scott, mm -hmm. in the back several times after running from a car doing a traffic stop, uh, and the traffic stop was based on the, uh, the fact that the officer suspected that he had not paid child support. Mm -hmm. He was shot in the back dead as he ran away, posed no threat to the officer, and then we saw an officer... So wait a minute, had... I didn't hear that quite right. You're saying that the police officer just saw a random black man and said, I bet you I can get something on him. I bet you he hasn't played, paid his child support. No, the officer had, had, had records and had reason to believe that Mr. Scott had not paid his child support and so pulled him over. And in the course of that, that uh, interaction, Mr. Scott left his car and began to flee, mm -hmm. and the officer shot him in the back. He posed no danger to the officer. He posed no danger to himself. He posed no danger to any other uh, human being um, in, in the vicinity, and yet he was shot down in, in, in broad daylight. Um, and the officer fabricated the story about a struggle with him and put a, a uh, what appears to be a, a gun next to his lane body mm -hmm. uh, to corroborate his story. So you started this off talking about an officer who was known to lie and mm -hmm. fabricate and that resulted in the unjustified uh, incarceration of innocent people. Walter Scott lost his life behind this, and we see that this sort of corruption um, and dishonesty is sadly far too rampant in law enforcement, uh, and it's something that, that we need to address. So um, the Legal Defense Fund has called for a pattern and practice investigation in, in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. um, the Department of Justice has not yet opened one, so we took the lead okay. in uh, holding a hearing. This is the second town hall hearing we've had since this incident, and we've gathered the stories and the data and the testimony from people in that community about their interactions with law enforcement. And we even uh, made sure that we had a bilingual forum so that our Latino brothers and sisters could also speak to their experience mm -hmm. with law enforcement and we now are building a record to expose the the the, the, the critical issues um, in South Carolina and to try to get justice for Walter Scott and others who have been um, violated. Well, Janae, thank you so much. Uh, this is attorney Janae Nelson, Associate Director Counsel of the Legal Defense Education Fund, and I want to thank you for all the great work that the uh, Defense Fund does and I can't wait to have you back on again, maybe with some good news. That's right. Let's, let's hope for that. All right, then. 1020 on the Talk of Chicago, 1690 WVON, 90 WVON, 90 WVON, 90 WVON.